thanks everyone for coming tonight. Um, again, my name is Kristen Leong. I'm a social scientist with NOAA Fisheries at the Pacific Islands Fisheries Science Center here in Honolulu. And so as a social scientist, we use a lot of different kinds of uh, sciences to study people. So we draw on anthropology, psychology, sociology, geography, depending on the kind of question, to better understand how people value and interact with resources, what they think is important, their preferences for management, and then also um, how they might affect or how management might affect them and how they might want to get involved. Um, so this project is one that uses a method called oral history. So this draws a lot from anthropology and other kinds of techniques to capture narratives or stories. And it's really compiling the individual stories of uh, a lot of bottom fish fishermen uh, from Hawaii. And you can see some of them along the top of the slide there. Um, that was a few years ago. But, uh, but that is one of the, the clubs that we were working with. Um, and I wanted to just start out by acknowledging the rest of our uh, partners on this project, because this project really couldn't have happened without a really big collaborative effort from a lot of people, uh, predominantly from the Pacific Islands Fisheries Group, which is a group of uh, fishermen, um, as well as the Western Pacific Regional Fisheries Management Council, or Westpac uh, the Council. And so Clay Tam is with PIFG. Kurt Kawamoto is, uh, he's a fisheries biologist with NOAA Fisheries. I work with him as well, but he's also a fisherman. Um, and Mark Mitsuyasu is with Westpac. And the three of them have really been the keys in coordinating uh, our involvement with the fishermen. They work, they interact regularly with them. They're part of that community. And so they're the ones that actually heard first from the fishermen that they wanted to do this study and um, brought that to the attention of NOAA. And then Justin Hospital is the head of the socioeconomics program. He worked with them to get all the funding in place um, to get this project going. Adam Ayers is another um, social scientist who works with us. He's been helping with the, some of the coordination, the development of the protocols and data collection. And Craig Severance is a retired anthropologist. He's based out of Hilo, and he's also does a lot of work with the Fisheries Council as well. So this is kind of the core project team. But again, it's a really uh, collaborative effort. So just as a, an overview of the project itself, um, the goal of the project overall is to really document how the culture, traditions, and techniques of the Hawaii bottom fish fishery have evolved from Native Hawaiian traditions as far back as people can remember anyway uh, to modern times. We'll be doing a little bit of um, historical document supplementation, but this is mostly from people's living memory that we're going to be talking about. Um, but many of the traditional techniques are still being used today. And then again, as I mentioned, we're going to be using, we are using oral histories to capture the stories from these fishermen. Um, but we've modified that a little bit with the fishermen interviewing other fishermen, um, taking advantage of the sort of uh, the talk story tradition that is prevalent here in the Hawaiian Islands. And I'll talk more about the, that in a little more detail. Before I jump into the specific study, though, I wanted to give you a little bit of background to set the stage thinking about fishing in Hawaii. And many of you are probably uh, familiar with some of this, but for those who are maybe uh, listening online or who might watch it later, I wanted to make sure that we have that overall context that we cover as well. So of course, Hawaii is in the middle of the Pacific Ocean, uh, and we're talking here about uh, Pacific Island communities that were, you know, the whole area um, was originally settled by Polynesian voyagers on these the large voyaging canoes like the Hokulea that we've just seen recently uh, coming back from its world tour. And on the right-hand side, the map on the right-hand side shows migration pathways of where the people came um, from the Far East and sort of settled, sort of island hopping, all the way out to Hawaii. And so this voyaging tradition goes back, this goes back to like 2500 BC. So this is a long time ago that we've had cultures that evolved with this very strong relationship with the ocean, with the sea, with marine resources. Um, and then in addition, of course, the influence of other modern Pacific Rim countries uh, coming to Hawaii as well. And so we have this real mix of different kinds of dynamic uh, Asian and Pacific Island cultures. And so that's uh, influenced the, the importance of fishing and seafood. Yes. Sure. I'll tell, and, and if you still can't hear me, I'll do it. I'll, I'll try to hold this whole closer and speak louder too. Um, so all of these different cultural influences, you really see a lot reflected in the importance of fishing and seafood in the culture and traditions in modern day Hawaii as well. Um, in the, the names of places, in the kinds of uh, religions, traditions, spirituality. 
and also in the, the kind of food that we eat. So the per capita seafood and consumption, consumption in Hawaii, if you compare that to the rest of the United States, on average, it's twice as high. So we eat a lot more seafood here. It's a big part of the culture. And then also when we start talking about commercial versus non-commercial fishing, traditionally, how um, fisheries are managed, there's a, a commercial, what's called commercial and recreational fishing. And what we've seen over and over again with the studies that have been done here in the Pacific Islands region is that it's not that clear cut. People who sell fish also will keep some to eat at home or to give away to their friends and their family. The sharing of fish is very important. That's a, that's a big part of the cultural tradition, the reciprocity. People who say that they're subsistence fishermen, they will also sell some fish as well. So you can't just really neatly separate people into commercial, non-commercial, recreational, cultural. It's usually a mix of all those different kinds of motivations. And actually one of the things that we're starting to see now as we talk to managers in other uh, regions of the United States and other fisheries councils, they're starting to recognize that as well. And they're saying, you know, that, that really resonates with us too. It's not really as clear cut as we'd like to say it is, even though that's how our surveys tend to treat things. And so they're look, turning to us now to say, well, how are you asking those questions? Because, you know, we, we want to try to, to get at that, that um, mix of different kinds of motivations as well. So in terms of the Hawaii bottom fish fishery, again, as I mentioned, it dates back to ancient times where native Hawaiians would go out on the outrigger canoes. And uh, this fishery targets fish that are very, very deep, that they hang out towards the bottom of the ocean at depths of 60 to even up to 1,200 feet. And um, so it takes specialized gear that can get the hooks and the bait down that deep. Uh, traditionally, uh, Hawaiians would use stones and sort of wrap the line around the stones to carry the, the hooks and the bait down that deep. And so this one you may have seen it posted on the Facebook page. I think I saw it on the Facebook page, this picture. is one of the trivia questions. It's called a make dog rig. And this is, a, this is one that has been used by fishermen recently, but it's really borrowing from the traditional uh, Hawaiian techniques um, and really is pretty similar to what they were using then. And um, we did learn in this process that maki dog is, comes from Japanese, actually, meaning wrapped gear, essentially, something like that. Does that sound familiar to folks? Anyway, so it was interesting. We, we had went through a little bit of the etymology of where that term came from. And some of you may, heard, may have heard of the deep seven bottom fish. These are a group of bottom fish that are regulated and managed. Um, there have been certain limits on them from time to time. And so these are the species here that you may have, some of you may have recognized from restaurants or you may already know about. Um, also, the deep seven are the ones that typically are targeted for uh, commercial sale as well. And much of this is because of the cultural significance of these fish, too. And that's one of the areas that we're really interested in trying to document. Um, some of the things that we know for sure that there's a big spike in uh, demand for bottom fish around the holidays, around New Year's especially. and for weddings, other kinds of celebrations like birthdays, graduations, first birthdays. Um, and a lot of that has to do, again, with that influence of the Asian cultures, where uh, red is a very important and auspicious culture, uh, symbolizing happiness and prosperity that you would want to wish on people on these kinds of occasions. And then also for the new year, uh, it's very important to have a whole fish. And the whole fish symbolizes the good luck uh, throughout the year from start to finish or from head to tail. So that, again, that's part of the display of having the whole fish on the plate. And that also determines the kind of fish that are at demand during that time of year. You want the right size of fish to fit on your, your party plate. It's a kind of party fish. And I'll talk about party fish a little bit too um, throughout the rest of the talk. You can also see the seasonal demand in the prices at the fish auction. I don't know if, uh, if any of you have been out to the fish auction at Pier 38. Have any of you been out there and seen how that works? So at Pier 38, um, there is a fish auction that happens every morning, really early in the morning, starts around 5 o'clock in the morning. Um, and it's the, actually the only U.S. Um, fresh tuna auction that's left, and it's the last, uh, or the, the last fresh fish auction for the, between Tokyo and Maine, the only one that exists between Tokyo and Maine. And so it's, and it's the only one with tuna. So it is uh, styled after the... Tokyo Fish Market, the fish auction in Tokyo, and they actually auction off individual fish one by one, and the wholesalers, they bid on that and they buy that. And so what you're seeing on here, this is a palette of um, bottom fish, 
And I don't know if you can, can see well, but the handwritten numbers on there, that's the price per pound. So there are some fish there that are $35 per pound or $31 per pound for a one pound fish. And again, this was taken on uh, December 29th, right before New Year's. And so you can see again, that spike in the seasonal demand it, and the prices really reflect that seasonal demand for that. Was that the price that they were, that fishermen were paid or the price that was this is the price that was sold that they were sold at auction. So it's whatever the wholesaler paid at the auction block. So that's a good point. You know, how much of that goes back to the fishermen, and then also how much would it cost in the market or in the restaurant? That's a different price than this. Uh, and actually, we did also go to the markets around this time of year, and you would not you would see the people who are buying these fish, but you would not necessarily see it on display in their markets because they would have a sign up that said, "People who pre-ordered their fish, we have your fish in the back." So there are people who are pre-ordering these fish. They don't necessarily go out on the display case. They're set aside because they know that they have people who have already asked for them. And again, ask for certain sizes, certain species, things like that. So of course today with the bottom fish fishery, uh, there have been some advances in technology. It's no longer really the uh, outrigger canoes that are being used, but more the motorized boats with the fiberglass hulls. There's also been advances in um, other kinds of technology like location equipment. So people are now able to use GPS and fish finders to get out to their spots much more quickly rather than having to use landmarks and kind of triangulate their way to find the good fishing spots, but they can just go straight there, punch it into the, GI the GPS. GPS is global positioning system. And so it's, a, it's technology that uses a satellite system to help you pinpoint where on the globe you are. And so you can just follow the directions in your GPS. It's kind of like what, um, what your car maps, the Google maps and things like that, they use the GPS to help, help you find your way and help you know where you are. So there are similar kinds of systems that can be used on the ocean for fishing boats. Once they get out to the fishing spot, though, the, the technique, again, is very similar to what the Native Hawaiians used, where you'd have the, some sort of weight, whether it's lead, whether it's stone, that gets your, your series of hooks down to the depth where your target species are. And then often there would be a chum bag that's, that's tied above that, and they'd have a little way to kind of bust open the chum bag when they decide it's the right time to attract the fish to their hooks. So again, and just now as you know, setting the stage, this is our our bottom fish project again, uh, with our overall goal to document the culture and traditions and how those have been changing. And as I mentioned, we're using this method of oral histories. And oral histories are a little bit different than um, some of the other kinds of social science methodologies that most people think about. A lot of people think about surveys when they hear social science, where you have a very specific questions that are asked in the same order. Maybe you have check boxes, or you have yes, no answers, or you have a scale of one to five, or how many of these things are important to you. Oral histories take a much more narrative approach. And so what we generally would do is our research team comes up with the kinds of overall themes and topics that we want to try to gather information about. But we really want the way that we talk about it to be driven by the experiences of the people that we're interviewing. So we ask broad, open-ended questions and let the people who are the interviewer, interviewees or the narrators tell us what about that is important to them. So we'll ask them things like, how did you get into bottom fishing? And so then by their answers, when we hear from many people, we'll listen for common themes over and over again to say, this is really what was important for people and why they got into the bottom fish fishery. Or these are the kinds of things that make it special to them. So we're not presupposing that we as researchers know that, but we're letting the, the uh, interviewees tell us what's important. Um, we did, again, modify the method a little bit so that it was the fishermen interviewing the fishermen. Again, typically with this kind of approach, you would have researchers who are interviewing um, the, the narrators. In this case, because there's a lot of specialized um, discussion that might happen with different kinds of uh, technology or things like that, and because the fishermen were the ones that wanted this project in the first place, we wanted to really allow the fishermen to talk with each other, have it be a little bit more personal one-on-one. -on -one. There were some pros and cons with that, also with the modified kind of top story approach as well, and I'll talk about that in a little bit more detail too. One question about why now? Why are we doing this project now? Um, if you th look back at the kind of the technology that we're talking about, those modern boats, um, it was really World War II that marked a significant change in the way that people were going out and, and fishing um, with the boats. And also modern fishery management really was not institutionalized until the 70s with the Magnuson-Stevens Act. And that's sort of what 
brought about NOAA fisheries and the way that we think about management today. So it's really not been that long that we've been managing uh, fisheries the way that we do now. And so if you think about the people who might have those experiences and be able to remember back to those times, time is really of the essence to capture those stories for the people who really pioneered the, the uh, bottom fish fishery. And then, of course, most importantly, the fishermen proposed the study. They really wanted to hear from each other, the people who are out uh, fishing today. So, you know, they were the ones saying, we really need to hear from these old timers, the ones that really kind of made a name for bottom fishing and capture those stories before it's too late. So that really drove a lot of uh, why we're doing this now. So within our broad goals, we do have some more specific objectives. Um, we want to develop a bottom fishing sort of family tree. The idea behind that is to kind of get a sense of um, how are, are there groups of people that, that learn from each other. One of the things that some research has shown for the longline fishery, for example, is that there are different ethnic groups that mostly kind of stay within their ethnic groups and there are a few a few people who kind of cross those lines, but that's kind of the, how the clusters work. We don't know if that's the same for bottom fish fishing, if it's fam literal families, if it's generations that kind of learn together, if it's sort of a couple key people. So those are, are the things that we will try to piece together. We're asking people, you know, who are their mentors and who have they mentored? And from that, we can kind of map out those connections. Um, we also want to document the evolution of local knowledge, how people's um, techniques and kinds of things have changed as they adapt to changes in the weather or climate or, or regulations, as regulations are put in place, how are people adjusting to that? As stocks kind of have boom and bust years, how do people adjust to that? We definitely have heard from people that there are certain time frames where fishing was uh, better than others, and that does seem to match up quite well with the stock assessment work. Um, and then also there were individuals who created their own kind of gear innovations. And so just learning from them how they did that, how that kind of spread throughout the fishery as well. Um, again, was it just key individuals or were there people that were all at the same time kind of developing the same things? And then overall, just recording the cultural practices and traditions that are specific to bottom fishing versus other kinds of fishing. So as I mentioned, um, the sort of modifications to a traditional oral history approach, the fishermen interviewing fishermen, and that modified talk story approach, both of them have some pros and cons. For fishermen interviewing fishermen, of course, a pro is that they can kind of talk shop. They really can key into the important topics that we need to make sure that we document and make sure that they're kind of elaborating on that so that we capture those stories. They know which things need more follow-up than um, people who maybe don't have that kind of insider knowledge. On the flip side, though, I mean, there are times that fishermen might not want to tell other fishermen things. They might want to keep their certain, their special fishing spots secret or um, not share certain kinds of information. And so as we were developing the questioning guide and as we were training the interviewers, we were really working on how do we ask these questions in a way that doesn't imply we're asking people to give up any secrets or, you know, ways that we're pre preserving the kinds of things that, that they want to maintain confidential, confidentiality. One of the other challenges, though, of course, is that insider knowledge might mean that people actually don't follow up on important uh, topics that we need to really make sure that we're capturing in our description, in our write-up afterwards. <laughs> so I mentioned party fish earlier. It might be that someone says, oh, you know, we go out when we need a party fish. And then the interviewer says, oh, okay, you go and you get party fish, because they know what a party fish is. But for people who are not from Hawaii, who maybe have not been to parties where you have that fish on the plate with that sort of elaborate display, that might not mean anything. And so we need to make sure that we are capturing those kinds of details so that when we do the analysis and we write it up, this is gonna be going out much more broadly than just Hawaii, um, that we share that level of detail. So we, we worked with the interviewers so that they remember when there are times like that, that they might know what it means to think about it. Like when you listen to a, a radio interview and the host is a, special, is a specialist in the topic, but they still ask questions like, you know, can you tell our listeners what a party fish is for the, those people who don't know? So even though they know, they're, they're acknowledging that they know, but they're also acknowledging that the listeners might want to learn about that. And so we kind of practice going through that technique as well. For the modified talk story approach, obviously a pro is that it's a tradition here in Hawaii. People are comfortable if you say, oh, we want to talk story about bottom fishing. They know what that means. That means we're going to we're going to come, we're going to sit down, we're going to have a conversation. It'll be pretty free flowing. It's not a very structured kind of survey instrument or things like that. 
Um, of course, one of the challenges that we also had to talk through as we were preparing for the interviews was thinking about the fact that the fishermen in this case would be the elders. And traditionally, if you're in a talk story kind of session, you let the elders guide where the conversation goes. And so what happens then if your interviewee is going off on tangents and for a long time that really aren't related to the topic of our research? How do we gently guide them back to the focus without sort of appearing that we're kind of being brusque or rude with that? So we did sort of practice some techniques that would help with that as well. Some of the things that we learned um, as we went out, we've done interviews uh, collectively on um, Maui, Kauai, the Big Island, here on Oahu, and then um, we're hopefully going to get some uh, from folks on Lanai as well. They might be coming out here for a, an event, so we'll hopefully be capturing that as well. But for each of these, we had a team of people. We had the people who were coordinating the contact with the interviewees. We had, we were also uh, audio taping and videotaping the interviews to make sure that we captured all the nuances of the discussion. Uh, and then we had NOAA staff who were helping take notes. One of the other things that you typically do with oral histories is you want to take what are called uh, field notes or th sort of thick description field notes that you note other kinds of things that are going on that help you remember context of the, the conversation or the situation that might be lost in just the audio. If there was some, something that people were pointing to or things like that with video, it's a little bit better. But we still wanted to make sure we had that backup. And that was one place where training the fishermen to do the interviews, they weren't quite comfortable learning the techniques for the interviews and then also learning how to take really detailed field notes. So that was our role as the NOAA staff was to kind of help with the logistics, helping people with the sign-in sheets, the, the permission forms, things like that, and then also taking the field notes on the side. Of course, what we found was that we were also asking people to bring any uh, photos or any different kind of gear that they wanted to share to make sure that we documented that and had that included in the project. And they were so generous that uh, the NOAA staff in some situations ended up spending most of their time being archivists and taking pictures of all of the different things, documenting all the different things that the interviewees were sharing. And so it was really a learning to balance the time between the archiving and the note taking. And then similarly, we ended up with some impromptu focus groups where we had scheduled individual one-on-one -on -one interviews. But again, the fishermen were excited to hear from each other and compare their experiences. And so many of them would stay and listen to the interviews of the people that came before them. And so by after a few of these, you have a group of people that are having little side discussions, which are really interesting, and on many of the topics that we're interested in for our research. So again, those we would try to capture as much in our note-taking as possible so we didn't lose those discussions because people tend to talk differently with their peers than they might, especially when you're on a, a recorded video setting. So again, we're, we're balancing that uh, archiving, taking notes on the main interview, and then taking notes on these kind of side conversations as well. And then, of course, we're uh, recognizing that sometimes formal cameras do change the dynamic. We were fortunate that we could work with Dean Sensui. He produces uh, Hawaii Gone Fishing, the TV sh show. And so those are the fancy, what we call the Dean Sensui cameras. Um, but they're the high quality video cameras that we were able to use for some of the, um, some of the interviews so that we will have some that we can produce into a high quality um, clips for shows like a, a show on Hawaii Goes Fishing or for other kinds of video outreach afterwards. But again, you know, you can imagine that having an interview in front of a big camera like that is a little bit more intimidating. For the other ones, we would use GoPros. So it's a little bit of a different dynamic. And so again, it was making sure that we were uh, working with the interviewees to make them comfortable, helping if there were conversations that we had heard kind of in these side conversations, helping to draw that out if they were kind of a little more closed up when they were in the front of the camera, reminding them to tell the stories that we might have heard about a little bit off camera as well. Um, so we are still, we have completed about 60 interviews and we're in the process of getting them transcribed now. And typically that would be the ideal way that you would move forward is that you would transcribe all the text of the interview so that you can go back and kind of quickly scan through them and look for themes. And then we will actually go through and we will, on a computer, we'll flag different sections of text by the themes that we're um, seeing. 
And so there were some themes that we already identified as part of the research that we were interested in. Again, that idea of who were your mentors, who were your mentees. But there are also some that, have, that, that come out sort of organically from the collective interviews. And so I wanted to just share with you some representative ones uh, that we're starting to hear already. And again, this is just our, our anecdotal sort of first pass from our experience collectively uh, in collecting the interviews, not yet through rigorous analysis. Um, but one, of course, as I mentioned, we were asking people why, why they like bottom fishing, why bottom fishing versus something else. And there was a lot of comparison to, the, to trolling, where, you know, trolling's fun, but you really go out there, you're out there for a long time, and you're waiting for the fun to happen. Um, the, happen hap the fun happens all at once when the reels go off versus bottom fishing where you're constantly doing something. You're having to uh, set the bait, you're having to check the line, and it's this, I like this one, it's a zen exercise where you try to figure out what are the fish doing down, down there. And people talked a lot about having their hand on the line and really feeling what's happening down at those depths and that being an important part of the fishing experience, that connection to what was going on underwater. And then some of the very experienced fishermen were even talking about, oh yeah, I can tell when a fish is nibbled, I can tell when I have one on the line, what species it is and how big it is, because they can tell by the, the pole and the weight and they know how far down they've put the bait. Uh, another example of um, the kinds of things that we we're talking about, again, this one is party fish. And so, um, we were asking people, again, this was trying to get at motivations for fishing, and we're asking them, you know, what determines when they sell catch or when they keep catch, and um, a few of them corrected us and said, well, we, we figure that out first before we go out. That's what determines why we're even out on the water in the first place, is that we know we have people that we want to get fish for. And so they figure out who do they need to get fish for. Maybe it's for a party. Maybe it's because they have people that they learned from who can no longer fish because they've become ill or for whatever reason, um, but they feel like they need to bring back fish for them because they learned from them. So again, that re reciprocity idea. So they figure out that's, that's what sort of inspires a trip is that we have these reasons that we need fish. We go out, we catch those fish, anything on top of that we can sell and that's extra. And maybe it makes back a little bit of money for the gas or the bait or the ice, anything on top of that is extra. But it's really sort of thinking about it, not in terms of how much how much money am I going to get out of this trip, but what do I need the trip for first? So that was a pretty uh, interesting thing to hear a number of times. And we had also people talking about this idea of putting fish in the bank. So the times of year where you have uh, more bottom fish or where the good season where the, the fish are bringing in more money, they can they try to sell fish during that time so that they have some money from fishing that they can use in other times of the year. Maybe there's a wedding that comes up in a time of year where fish are not so plentiful, but because they've banked that fish during the good season, if they're not successful on that trip, they have money that they can buy a fish for that occasion. People also talked a lot about family, especially as a way that they got into fishing. Um, you know, saying they just got involved by tagging along with their dad or their uncles, um, learning from them, learning the spots from them, and people really talking about knowing those good fishing spots as being really important to the success of fishers. Um, you know, people that can be really successful right out the gate because they have that knowledge that's passed down of where are the good spots for the fish. They also talked about um, some concerns, though, that the younger generation is not as involved in fishing as they used to, so there's not really as much recruitment into the fishery. And we're hearing this a lot from um, other fisheries around across the country as well, this idea of the graying of the fleet. It's not really as popular a profession as it used to be. And so what are the implications of that as we kind of move into the future? I think those will be some things that we're going to have to be thinking about quite a bit. Uh, another thing that we asked about was uh, differences and that we're trying to see, especially from making sure that we talk to people on different islands, is differences um, between people who fished in different locations. And so, for example, the top right quote is from some folks um, on Kauai, and they talked about the weather on Kauai being a little bit rougher. Uh, the water conditions are rougher, there's more winds, and so in some places, uh, people were talking about, well, when the wind is above a certain amount, then we're not going to go out because it's not comfortable out on the water. And in Kauai, they're saying, if you're waiting for light and variables, you're going to go broke. You just have to learn how to fish in the wind if you're going to fish out here. And so this was another thing that some of the um, the ecosystem modelers were really interested in. They, they were even asking the question of, so can we model, if we know what the wind is, can we model them? That would probably be a time when fishers wouldn't go out on the water. 
And from this, we're saying, well, you know, it depends on what size boat they have. It depends on where they are. It depends on their experience. It depends on the comfort level. So that's probably not a good standardized thing to try to put into your model. On the left-hand side, under the vertical picture here, this is someone who's, this picture is from uh, fishing out in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands, and the quote is also from someone who was fishing out there, and really talked about the reasons to go to the Northwest Hawaiian Islands because it was an adventure. It was an expedition getting ready for those kinds of trips. You're going out to this place where there isn't anybody else around. You have to rely on yourself. And so again, that's a very different motivation than some of the people who we're hearing from on the main Hawaiian Islands. Some people who said, well, I don't, I, now that I can go out, now that we have better motors and things like that, I don't have to stay out overnight. I'd rather just go out and stay in, and sleep in my own bed. So there's, again, very different motivations for fishing depending on where people were going. And then you can kind of see that, that adventure side uh, in this quote as well. I think commercial fishermen are modern day cowboys. It's that risk taking, that adventure. Again, we were hearing that quite a bit. Um, and then one person, the large, the long quote on the right hand side again is um, from someone who was fishing quite regularly up in the Northwest Hawaiian Islands. And he was talking about a time that he was caught out in a hurricane. And he had, he said that he had, his crew was a whole bunch of big, huge Samoan guys and they were all completely scared and they were inside hunkered down. And he wasn't at all, he loved it. He, he knew his boat could handle it and he was just out you know, in the wheelhouse and he was just enjoying the noise and the wind and everything thrashing around. And that was, that sense of adventure was what really made it for him. So we heard a lot of different kinds of ways of talking about um, fishing, but sort of pretty much everybody kind of was talking about all the different trips and how they're special to them and how it was important to them to think about respecting the ocean and respecting what it provides and being able to, to give back. And then, you know, sort of in a parallel to that, giving back to the fishery through this project by sharing their stories, by sharing their experiences and their history. So those were some of the, the themes that we had kind of been thinking about and looking for a little bit. We also had some things emerge that we were not really specifically expecting, um, but we had art come up a number of times. And so on, these are, the left-hand side is a picture that was shared with us by Kurt Kawamoto, who's also actually one of the, he's one of the project coordinators, but he's also a very respected and well-known fisherman too. So we, we convinced him that he needed to be interviewed for this project and he shared with us some of his photos. So the picture is with um, a fish print or a kitaku that's being made of a, an onaga that he caught. You can see it's a pretty large fish that he caught there. Um, so we have the fish prints and then also the, um, the man whose back is to the camera on the right hand side um, Stephen Kimura is a fisherman that we were interviewing, and he wore this shirt to his interview that was hand painted by his wife Sachi, and so that's a picture of her. And she paints uh, she paints all kinds of shirts and hats and and things like that, and gives them away to people as gifts. So again, you know, the fishing is not just economic; it's sort of it's a part of their identity. It's a part of the, the, their culture in many ways. We also heard from. Um, some people that once they really got into bottom fishing and uh, started to get good at it, they also got interested in things like um, sushi displays. And so one of them had bought this, you know, one of the fancy wooden boats that you can make the elaborate sushi displays on it. And apparently he makes quite beautiful sushi displays. And so we were trying to convince him that he needed to um, share a picture of that with us or let us come see one and maybe try it out. I don't know. <laughs> but so we're hoping that we can get a, at least a picture of one of his displays for the project as well. Um, so again, some things that we weren't expecting to hear, um, but I think that may come out as things that we end up talking about a little bit. Another question that we asked sort of along these lines, uh, that we ended up asking more regularly along these lines was about the kinds of fish that people like to eat, uh, how the recipes that people had, what was their favorite way to prepare the fish. And some of that depended on personal preferences. For some people they said, you know, they sell onaga, that brings a, in a big price, but they don't personally like it as much because it's a little bit crunchy. Um, other people had different kinds of preferences, but one thing that we heard, or at least I heard personally a number of times, and again, I didn't go to all the interviews, I just went to a handful of them, but I heard a lot of people talking about uh, Chinese style gindai with the, the hot oil, the soy sauce, and the, the scallions and ginger. Of course, every time they talked about that, it made me hungry. So I'm thinking that maybe that's something that we might need to, at the end of our project, have a big uh, party and have fish you know, in the different recipes that people uh, suggested. 
So at this point, we have, again, uh, about 60 interviews that are completed, um, or I should say interviews with about 60 fishermen. So some of those were group interviews. Um, and those are in the process of being transcribed. We have um, over 900 pages of transcripts right now, and that's for about a third of the interviews. So you have a lot of data to be going through and coding, looking for those themes. Uh, we are starting to work on um, products like web stories, blog posts, things to keep people up to date as to where we are in the process of the project. Uh, the picture that's up there is of myself and Kurt, Kalmoto and Clay Tam from um, PIFG in uh, the studio with Mike Buck uh, for his radio show, Go Fish. And this is when we were still at the stage of recruiting interviewees. So we were telling them a little bit about the project and, and had an open invitation if people wanted to take part in the project um, to please contact us. And we still can do some interviews. So if there are folks that have some experience out there and want to share their stories, we're, we're open to um, adding more to the project as well. The, the web address on the bottom is where all of our blog posts will be. It's a little bit long. It's PISC blog, P-I-F-S-C blog dot wordpress.com slash category slash socioeconomics. Um, but we do also have the full radio interview available there too, so you can listen to that online. And that's what we'll be adding to pieces as we kind of complete different pieces of the analysis. And then of course our next steps, the main big one is going to be analysis, and that is going to be a large project um, but we're pretty excited about it based on the kinds of things that we've been hearing. I think it'll be a lot of fun. It'll be time consuming, but it will be, it will be fun. And again, um, oh, I'll talk a little bit more about Voices from the Fisheries in a minute. We, we do plan to post the uh, interviews there. Uh, we need to clean them up a little bit for things like if there's any specific you know, spots that are a little bit, um, if there's anything that we want to keep confidential, if there are people's names or things that they decide that they don't want to share more broadly then we'll redact that from the interviews, but otherwise we want to have those interviews available so other people can listen to them. Again, the blogs, TV, radio spots, uh, working with um, Dean Sensui to do the Hawaii Goes Fishing show. Again, once we figure out what the kind of the bottom line points are, um, and potentially even traveling exhibits, maybe something at the Bishop Museum or hopefully something like that. Um, but then ultimately, though, our goal would be to integrate the local knowledge, the collective local knowledge from these fishermen um, into management of the bottom fish fishery. So what are the things that we're learning from them in terms of what's important to preserve about the kinds of techniques that they use or things that we think about in terms of regulations? We did hear a little bit about things like the, um, as the bottom fish restrict the restricted fishing areas that, uh, you know, people talked about when, before those were in place, they would naturally rotate their fishing spots because they didn't want to overfish a particular location. But when a whole geographic area is closed, then they individually have fewer places that they can rotate through. So it's making them concentrate their efforts more. So it's kind of an interesting question of you're closing these particular areas um, because you're trying to reduce the pressure, but then you're inadvertently creating pressure in other areas. So I think that would be something to potentially um, look into a little bit more. So as I mentioned, we want to um, ultimately post many of these interviews on the Voices from the Fisheries Project. This is an initiative that um, is spearheaded through our, our Office of Science and Technology, the headquarters office based out of Silver Spring, Maryland. And it's one of their overarching human dimensions projects um, that is an, at the national level. And so what they're doing here is they're archiving uh, different kinds of oral history projects. So ours will be one of the series of oral history projects that they have there. And those oral histories are then available for anybody to access and use. So we have you know, teachers that have used these for classrooms to learn about techniques of oral histories or just to learn about a project. They might have things that you know we've analyzed these interviews for certain kinds of themes related to management. There might be other kinds of questions that uh, school rooms might want to, want to um, explore. So we want to make those available there. So this is another long website, but it's uh, www.st.nmfs.noaa.gov slash human dimensions slash voices dash from dash the dash fisheries slash index. But again, that is uh, ultimately where a lot of the raw data will be going as well. So we're trying to make all of this information public and available. And I guess with that, I will take any questions that you might have. Yes. 
after the wild fish eat between 180 and 27, about 60 to 400 feet, after they're hunting for their food and they ate, where do they go to sleep? The question was, where do the bottom fish go to sleep after they've eaten at those depths? And, you know, I don't know the details of the bottom fish life history, but generally they kind of, they are found at those depths. They sort of, they're fish that stay at different depths of the ocean. So that's sort of where those fish kind of hang out in general. I don't think it's that they're going down there to eat and then come back up. They're just sort of, that's the level that they tend to be found at. Do they go to the reef? Do they go to the reef? These are not reef fish. They're a different kind of, different kind of fish entirely, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, the habitat that they prefer is down at those deep depths in the bottom of the ocean. Yeah. Any other questions? Oh, yes, another question. Yeah. NOAA is a big federal agency, right? Where does the science center fit in NOAA's uh, that's a good question. So the question is, NOAA is a big federal agency, and where does the Science Center fit in the hierarchy of NOAA? And I will do my best to explain that because that one is, is kind of tricky. So you're right. NOAA is a big federal organization. NOAA stands for National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration. And so there are many what are called different um, line offices within that. So the National Weather Service is part of NOAA. The weather satellites are part of NOAA. Um, there are people who are watching the storm, tsunami, and warnings. Those, those are all NOAA as well. Um, then there's NOAA Ocean and Coastal Services, and they kind of look at what's going on with the, the coastal resources. So the office that, uh, that NOAA, the Science Center is under, is a line office called the National Marine Fisheries Service. And so that's why a lot of our emphasis is on fisheries. Uh, and then also protected species um, like um, sea turtles and monk seals and the protected species that might interact with fisheries as well. So that falls under NOAA fisheries. And so within NOAA fisheries, in each of the regions, there are different regions around the country. So we're in the Pacific Islands region, which is Hawaii, um, CNMI, Guam, American Samoa. And so our region covers that area and the science center provides science about that region um, for the regional office and for the fisheries council does that help okay yes so does no fisheries have a regulatory uh, role or is it just the western pacific uh, council that sets everything up and you guys are just uh, giving expertise or something. so the question was does NOAA have a regulatory role or is it just the fisheries council that sets everything up and we're just giving it sort of the expertise so it's a it's a little bit of a of both um, so with the fisheries council NOAA is a member of the fisheries council the regional office is a member of the fisheries council um, so in that respect, and many of us from the Science Center are on different committees, science committees. Um, I'm on the Social Science and Research Committee. I'm on the Archi Archipelagic Plan team, for example. Um, so we provide that expertise on the teams that are part of the Fisheries Council. The Fisheries Council technically makes recommendations that are actually signed off on by NOAA's regional office. Generally speaking, though, the regional office is probably going to sign off on whatever the council comes to together because it is a co collaborative effort, and that makes sure that we have the input from the scientists, from the fishermen, from the state agency, from the sort of the territorial governments. So we have, you know, because the things that the council comes up with have gone through that process that have really included all of that different kind of feedback, unless there's something that's really egregious, it's, pro it's probably just going to go through the um, regional office. And that's part of the job of the council is to make sure it isn't. Is everything consolidated on Ford Island? I believe so. Um, yeah, for the most part. I mean, you're right. So um, until a few years ago, there were many NOAA offices that were all over different parts of Oahu, really, and not even just Honolulu. And so those offices were consolidated a few years ago into the Inouye Regional Center 
the IRC on Fort Island. And so on one side of the building is the regional office, that's the management side, and then the other side of the building is the science center, which is the side that I work with. So there was a recommendation that anyone who gets a chance to take a tour of the facility, it is a very nice facility, it's a very modern, it's a LEED certified facility, big you know, uh, glass windows, there are all kinds of displays in the visitor center, um, there are videos of the, the research cruises, there are live feeds from the research cruises when they're out, um, and there's a cafeteria there, so it is, it is a pretty nice place to work.